If the COVID-19 global pandemic has taught us anything, it's how, in fact, small the global community is. More than anything, what COVID has done, despite all the negatives, is show us that we can collaborate, we should collaborate, because we've got similar challenges globally. And I think in this, the All Atlantic Ocean Research Forum, prior to even COVID, the visionary thinking to say that solutions come from collaborative efforts, come from innovative efforts that are garnered and brought together by different nations and contributed to by different nations. And with that, I welcome you officially to unofficially officially, because we will get an official, official welcome by the Director Generals in a moment, but I welcome you. My name is Tulile Kanyile. I am coming to you from the very chilly South Africa in Johannesburg today and hope you are comfortable and doing well where you are and looking forward to the forum today. And really the forum today and the forum tomorrow is looking at having discussions around how this COVID-19 has affected us and how we can put together recovery plans and as policymakers, as community, as researchers to mitigate some of the challenges that have, brought, have been brought forward by COVID-19. We have an array of speakers from Polar to Polar that will be engaging with us from today and tomorrow. And I have met majority of them and I assure you that we're going to have a stellar conversation over the two days coming. Like I said, my name is Tudile Kanyile. I am your moderator. I am a molecular biologist by training. I'm a lecturer at the University of the Witwatersrand. I'm also a social entrepreneur who cares a lot about how we create a pipeline of high school kids to feed into research and innovation. So the forum is going to look at research activities that contribute to socioeconomic recovery of countries from COVID-19 as I've stipulated. And before going any further, just to start off with a little bit of uh, uh, some house rules for all of my speakers, please remember to mute after you've had your, your contribution. And at this particular moment, I'm also gonna take the time to welcome all of our viewers that are on this Zoom platform, all of our viewers streaming live on the um, Facebook as well as on YouTube. Please do submit your questions and your comments through the chat. Your questions, we'll try to get to as many of them as we can, but I cannot promise that I will get to all of them, but I will try my best to go um, through as many questions as I can, given, of course, the time. For all of us that are on social media, please do ensure that, as we've said, the global community is shrinking. The global community has similar problems, similar challenges, and we want the global community to know about this conversation. So the hashtag to use when we communicate on social media is hashtag Atlantic all. So join the conversation on these social media platforms and ensure that everyone that is out there is also participating. To the panelists, I really do look forward to all of your contributions and I look forward to the conversation. In South Africa, in my native language, we say when we greet Sanbona, which is to say we see you, which is to say we acknowledge you, you matter, we see you. And um, with that, I think I'm going to segue into the video of South Africa that's going to show the energy and the essence of South Africa and the people of South Africa. And with that, um, over to uh, technical for the video. Thank you. But Bamzanzi, Rona, we move different. We speak different, we're made different. But Bamzanzi, we're brave. Not only are we a nation that appreciates those that died so that we could be born free, we're a nation that refuses to be defined by our past. But Bamzanzi, we thrive. Pella, we have this ability to show utmost tenacity to achieve the unimaginable. A nation filled with innovative thinkers, generating ways to change the world and create a livelihood for fellow South Africans. We don't wait for an opportunity to knock. We're a nation brave enough to build a door using the spirit and vision of those who lived before us. But Bamzanzi, we are one of a kind. 
We're a nation that unites and supports each other despite our differences. A nation filled with cultural richness. A nation that continues to break boundaries using our freedom of self-expression. A nation brave enough to believe in staying true to ourselves while remaining outstanding. And that's why in Mzanzi, we trust. A brave nation indeed, and indeed in Mzanzi, we do trust. I hope that with that video, you feel welcome into South Africa and you feel a little bit closer to the nation and its people. I mean, we are here after all for the All-Atlantic Ocean Research Forum. And I think what's important is to have a look at how this alliance was formed. What is this alliance about? And I think the next video that we will play, the anchor video, will show us where we come from as this alliance, why we have this forum today, what it aims to do and encapsulates really a beautiful introduction for the today as well as tomorrow. Thank you again, over to Technical for that anchor video. The ocean is key for us. Life would not exist without it. And yet, we are damaging it. Designing policies for ocean sustainability requires accurate observations and scientific information. We cannot do the science that is needed and the observations that are needed to sustain the Atlantic ourselves. No one nation can do it. Building on the success of the Galway Statement, various countries decided to connect their initiatives to support a massive transatlantic cooperation. So in our dialogues with Brazil and South Africa, we saw an increasing desire for us to work together to mobilize the community in the South Atlantic and to build on what had happened in the North Atlantic. The Bellum Statement, together with the agreements with Cabo Verde and Argentina, constituted the next step in creating the All-Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance, a group of countries from pole to pole, all with a common goal, enhancing marine research and innovation cooperation for the benefit of citizens. Our All-Atlantic Ocean Cooperation will ensure that research and innovation provide the solutions to the communities faced with a changing Atlantic Ocean, leading to a more sustainable future. Co-responsibility, co-ownership and co-implementation will be the pillars for tackling key common areas of interest. Working together to share resources and to collect data will map unknown territories, align budgets and maximise the benefits for citizens. These things in the oceans are very expensive and the instruments that we use for research. So I think that together uh, we can be able to share the costs. But uniting countries is not enough. We are opening the initiative to society, including the public, to build the All-Atlantic Ocean Research community. The, the policies it will only make a difference if the population itself understands why are you doing it. By collaborating with the youth to have ocean-engaged citizens from an early age, our alliance gives the next generation the tools to create a more sustainable Atlantic. Uh, there's a very good African saying that says, if you want to go far, you go alone. If you want to go further, you go together. So join us and help make our Atlantic a better, bluer place for all. Indeed, if you want to go far, you go together. And to illustrate that very last um, African uh, proverb that was um, said there in the video, we will recall that this uh, forum is co-hosted by South Africa and the European Commission. And with that, in the spirit of going far together, I'm going to introduce Director General of Science and Innovation, Dr. Philem Joacha. Um, 
from South Africa. Over to you, uh, DG. Thank you very much, uh, Tuli, and like to acknowledge all the guests that we have uh, this afternoon, and in particular, my co-host, uh, DG Jean Eric Parker from the EC, dear partners of the Atlantic Ocean Research Forum, ladies and gentlemen. The year 2020 brought us the challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic and brought with it a number of global challenges, including those that are health, social, and economic related. The global community was forced to work together to find solutions together and learn from each other. For the first time, it became evident that we are one people, we need each other to survive, and also many myths were globally dispelled. But most importantly, everyone wanted to know what do scientists say about any decision or policy decision about the pandemic. Under these horrendous circumstances, science, technology, and innovation uh, got onto the, uh, onto the center stage. It is thus my privilege and a pleasure to welcome you, although I'm doing this virtually in South Africa, for the third All-Atlantic Ocean Research Forum. We had initially planned to welcome you in Cape Town overlooking the Atlantic Ocean, but unfortunately COVID-19 had other ideas. I appreciate the spirit of the all Atlantic Ocean research community that adapted and opted to continue and focus on finding solutions to societal challenges that are also aggravated by the pandemic. Given the multitude of global challenges that we face, international cooperation is imperative for science to advance. Science knows no borders. No country is strong or big enough to act on its own. We need to join forces, share our resources, experience and expertise as was demonstrated by the video. We are as the program director indicated co-hosting this event with our collaborative partners, the European Commission. I will later on hand you over to DG Jean Eric Paquet of the EC Directorate General of Research and Innovation who will also soon welcome you. However, I do like to give you a little bit of history about this collaboration between South Africa and the European Union, where we share very, very strong partnership in the area of research. For background purposes, science and technology cooperation agreement between the two was concluded in 1996 and was of the first agreements that the EU and South Africa signed since democracy in 1994. South Africa has a very successful cooperation with the EU on a number of areas and these include research cooperation in health, bioeconomy, food and nutrition security, and sustainable agriculture, as well as in marine research. In 2016, though, we decided to formally highlight the Atlantic Ocean as a specific area of collaboration through a declaration of intent on marine research and innovation cooperation between the two countries. Uh, and this was concluded in Cape Town. And the great story about this is that it was concluded on the 3rd of October, 2016, which was a celebration uh, of 20 years of collaboration uh, between ourselves and the EU, uh, which had been signed 20 years ago. I also wish to welcome Professor Moniba Isaacs, a South African expert on the Atlantic Ocean Social Sciences, who will provide a keynote address that will initiate our social responsibility discussions. Whilst on background in 2016, Brazil hosted the first all Atlantic Ocean Research Forum in the historically significant and beautiful city of Bahia. This meeting marked the beginning of significant changes as we can see the outcomes of that engagement in the form of a number of successful EC funded Horizon 2020 collab collaborative projects that will be showcased tomorrow. The Brazilian meeting provided a platform for our researchers to engage each other towards a common goal. 
it is now evident that the All Atlantic Ocean Research Partnership is bearing fruits, and we hope a lot more is still to come. The All Atlantic Ocean Research Collaborative Partnership also brought with it a number of other significant activities, such as the All Atlantic Ocean, Ocean Youth Ambassadors Program that was launched in Galway in 2018. This program provided an opportunity for the All Atlantic Young Torchbearers to assist in tackling some of the societal challenges and engage the global community. Due to home ground advantage privileges, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Sandra Poma and Sinekuku Banda, the South African Youth Ambassadors, for their contribution and wish them well in their finalization of their writings of doctoral degrees. I believe they will bring new professional dimensions to the All Atlantic community. The new cohort of the All Atlantic Ocean Youth Ambassadors will be launched tomorrow, and I'd like to wish them well. We are, of course, disappointed that we had hoped to launch them physically and enable all of them to experience uh, these two oceans aboard uh, one of our vessels, but unfortunately, COVID-19 prevented that. But it is not all gloomy, as this might, might still happen later, but under different conditions. Earlier this year, in February, the European Commission hosted the second All Atlantic Ocean Research Forum. That meeting crafted a vision on how to strengthen international cooperation and how to seize the opportunities that would assist in addressing common challenges facing the Atlantic Ocean communities. As the host, South Africa aims to derive from this meeting ways and actions in which this community can contribute to the socioeconomic recovery with a special focus on the specific actions that would bring along positive impact on the Atlantic Ocean communities. Hence, we encourage you to embark on discussions aligned with this globally important and significant theme, and the uh, program director has already highlighted this. For our part of South Africa, we just want to assure you that we will ensure that we will continue our current investments in science and innovation as they serve as an integral part of the national growth and development objectives. We recognize that South Africa enjoys a geographic advantage, including our rich biodiversity and diverse climatic conditions arising from the Atlantic, Indian, and Southern Oceans. We recognize our geographic advantage, and as South Africa is a country surrounded by these three oceans, hence we have developed several strategies on the oceans, and we have also acknowledged that the ocean is also an economic driver, hence the ocean starts as the initial plan to implement our national development plan in the form of Operation Pakisa, ocean economy that you've been informed of in the last two meetings. The United Nations has proclaimed on 5 December 2017 that a decade of ocean science for sustainable development will be from 2021 to 2030. The decade of ocean science will focus on efforts to reverse the cycle of decline in ocean health and ensure that global ocean stakeholders are gathered behind a common framework to ensure ocean science can fully support countries in creating improved conditions for sustainable development. With the COVID-19 challenges, the discussions over the next few days are encouraged to look at key social elements that would enhance our commitment to contribute collectively. I'm also glad we, that we as the Department of Science and Innovation are contributing one of the two African intellectuals to the initial nine member executive planning group team that is now reduced to 18 as Dr. Ricardo Serrao Santos now serves as Portugal Minister of the Sea. This is a global expert group tasked to serve as an advisory body to the IOC governing bodies to support the development of the implementation plan of the decade and the preparatory activities. As indicated, second day discussions will mainly be directed towards some of the key activities that have already been initiated globally and locally, as well as reflect on some of the actions needed across the various themes. 
I'm also happy to announce that Dr. Vladimir Rayabinin, the Executive Secretary of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, IOC, will lead discussions, and I'd like to thank him uh, in advance. Africa as a continent matters in the building of the All Atlantic Ocean Research Forum, and that all efforts will be made to expand the participation through regional bodies, namely the Benguela Current Commission and the Abidjan Commission. As the current chair of the African Union, South Africa is pleased to welcome the African countries participating in this forum. Dr. Karim Hilmi, the IOC Vice Chair for Group 5, will lead these discussions tomorrow as a key in his keynote. I thank you and look forward to informative discussions and successful cooperation going forward. And again, I'd like to welcome you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mjwaka, for that very insightful and that very in-depth opening, giving us really good hope and a really good understanding of where we're going as a country, as a continent, and as, as the Alliance um, holistically. And now, um, as we've said, we're co-hosting with the E, um, with the European Commission. And with that, I'd like to welcome the video that will have the opening address by DG Jean-Éric Poquet as he's unable to be with us live today. Thank you very much, uh, Rafilwe. You can load that uh, opening. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's a pleasure and really an honor to have the opportunity to open this All Atlantic Research Forum together with my friend and partner, Director General Phil M. Drara. Phil, good afternoon. And to kick off what I hope will be a very exciting moment for a cooperation across the entire Atlantic uh, and for the first time uh, we are really bringing together research communities from south to north and Phil uh, thank you again for really driving the agenda in the South Atlantic allowing also the very powerful uh, African research and innovation communities in South Africa and beyond to be part uh, of that uh, international and global effort and so to host uh, this forum uh, with us uh, now. The, the forum is for me uh, the best illustration that um, science uh, globally is driving uh, policies, public policies, uh, which aim at addressing challenges at global level, challenges which all our societies are confronted with, and indeed holding this forum now in this uh, digital format uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic is indeed the illustration that uh, on COVID-19 the world is coming together. Science never progressed as uh, fast as has been the case in 2020. Against, against this extraordinary uh, pandemic we have seen uh, amazing progress in a matter of uh, days, weeks, months and now less than a year to produce um, better health policies, more and better testing, emerging therapies, and of course, uh, the remarkable progress which we all witnessed on, on vaccines. Vaccine breakthroughs have been announced um, uh, for at least uh, three vaccines in the recent uh, weeks, uh, uh, where a lot of science, um, science which was shared, collaborative effort on genome sequencing at the outset, but then also with a lot of sharing of uh, clinical data along the way, I think this has uh, certainly contributed, in particular as far as the European BioNTech vaccine is concerned, to these um, amazingly fast uh, development effort where uh, efficacy and safety, of course, remain uh, at the heart of the effort. And I very much welcome that uh, BioNTech, together with its partner in the United States, has now a thought authorization from European regulatory authorities. So 
Science has been a global effort. Science has been allowing to deal with the pandemic and very much I hope that science will allow us to return progressively to a new normal in the coming weeks. The forum, uh, I think, is the appropriate moment to anticipate that return to a new normal, anticipate it by uh, discussing and uh, shaping an agenda around the Atlantic Ocean, which should be the agenda of our recovery, the agenda allowing to repair our societies, and the agenda which uh, repairing and recovering allows us also to transform into a a greener, more sustainable, certainly also a more digital uh, world uh, in the next uh, months and years. You're aware that uh, in Europe the Green Deal is very much uh, Europe's growth and recovery strategy. We are investing uh, massive uh, resources uh, already in investment into the future. We want to recover and um, build back better, as our partners across the world are also saying. And in this um, agenda, of course, uh, research plays a very central role. And I therefore uh, expect uh, with Phil that during the forum uh, you will identify um, uh, around the Atlantic where you believe that uh, science and research needs to provide certainly knowledge, but also solutions, be it technology or uh, experimentation uh, in society uh, around the ocean, uh, solutions to drive these recoveries and these transformations. I think uh, the work which has been done uh, in North and South Atlantic over the many years, spearheaded by all of you and by uh, the teams around uh, John Bell in the European Commission, have really paved the way for the forum now to come forward with these solutions. So be it skills, technologies, work across uh, sectors, I, I very much expect and, and, and know uh, that we will uh, make a, a decisive step during the forum. This will then, as far as uh, the European Union is concerned, find its way into the European Green Deal, again research but also early delivery, and I would like here particularly to highlight um, the Horizon Europe uh, missions. Uh, you are certainly aware of the Ocean and Starfish mission, which was led uh, uh, by a mission board headed by uh, Pascal Lamy in the last uh, 12 months. And we now have, uh, with the report from the mission board, if you want, a blueprint to show how uh, we could um, uh, progress on cleaning up our oceans and of course more generally our water systems connected to our oceans and by doing so uh, restore ecosystems but also help communities um, uh, on these oceans living from the ocean uh, but also uh, nurturing uh, the ocean uh, to recover and become uh, more resilient. This Horizon Moonshot mission, alongside uh, four other missions, very connected also to the climate agenda, uh, will be very much uh, about connecting research and outcomes. As I explained generally for the Green Deal, what I hope we will be able to do with the missions is to identify a very concrete objective in Europe to begin with, but possibly also with partners interested to do it uh, alongside the European Union, very concrete targets, very concrete milestones on the way to uh, recover and to clean up uh, our oceans and water systems. Once these milestones and objectives are agreed, and again uh, the uh, draft report from uh, Pascal Lamy's mission board is uh, of course the central contribution to that uh, effort ahead of us, we would then identify what research is needed, what science is needed, what new knowledge needs to be created, but we would at the same time also um, explore uh, how we can plan a, a recovery and investment plan allowing these long-term objectives to be progressively uh, delivered in society. So connecting research, science, results with public policies, with engagement of communities, with, I also hope, commitments uh, from industries so that um, our oceans um, drive a better society and that we indeed have these clean oceans uh, 
by 2030 would be, I think, uh, a headline ambition. Colleagues, this is going to be a, a, a lot of uh, exciting uh, engagement around the missions and more generally around the Green Deal. And again, I think the All Atlantic Research Forum is really a, an amazing platform uh, to have this discussion more globally. I very much hope that uh, you will agree to work uh, uh, largely along these lines. And let me finish by, of course, also saying that um, I'm really delighted and also on behalf of uh, Commissioner Maria Gabriel uh, to uh, note the launch of the uh, All Atlantic Youth Ambassadors. I find this is uh, an amazingly exciting process and uh, I really look very much forward to continuing to work with your ambassadors. Um, I have met uh, several of you uh, already, in particular uh, for the North Atlantic, and we have uh, high expectations that you can um, be major drivers in engaging communities, mentors also to bring uh, new scientists in this amazingly important uh, part of science and help us indeed connect science results with the uh, policies and with uh, results in society. So Young Ambassadors, uh, the forum is also your forum and I very much look forward to seeing discussions uh, between uh, you and uh, scientists, policymakers, uh, north, south, across the Atlantic. Dear colleagues, I wish you all the best for the forum and Phil, uh, with you, I'm looking very much forward to see the results. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, video and I think what comes across from both DGs here is in fact that as a global community, this forum is here for us to be able to discuss and look to how we can combine all of the different facets that we've got going on around the ocean, be it the policymakers, be it the resources, the infrastructure, the skill set. I think it's coming out very strongly that there's a positive drive uh, towards achieving all of these uh, goals towards uh, achieving socioeconomic uh, prosperity. Um, and development for the communities in and around the Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. And I think some of the things that I really, really liked that came out of those uh, two openings was, in fact, that science knows no borders. Uh, Dr. Mjoha says, he says, uh, we need to find the solutions together and we are one people and we need each other. And then uh, uh, Mr. DG Pouquet goes on to say that this forum is an illustration of the science globally that drives policy, in turn, touching directly the lives of people. And I think, um, thank you very much to both the DGs for opening the floor for us. And now we can be really comfortable because our co-hosts have let us know that the floor is ours. They are listening. They want to hear what we're saying and they're in support of all of us. And also to the youth ambassadors, the messages are clear to you there. Both DGs clearly um, indicating the importance of young people um, and their participation in driving the Atlantic Ocean, its research and innovation. And now we move on to our keynote speaker, Professor Moniba Isaacs, who is the academic coordinator at the Institute for Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies, PLUS, which is an independent policy institute within the University of the Western Cape here in South Africa. Her research focus is on the understanding, is on understanding the social and political processes of fisheries reform in South Africa. She has extensive experience in working with South African fishing communities to find policy solutions. She is also a founding member of a global partnership program, Too Big to Ignore. She leads the international research cluster on fish as food for the global partnership on small scale fisheries. Too big to ignore. She co-chaired the Human Dimension Working Group on Integrated Marine Biogeochemistry Ecosystem Research from 2010 to 2015. And I think with that, Professor Isaacs, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Tule, uh, for your um, uh, introduction. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, uh, yeah, I think I can start my video too. Uh, it's a little bit um, 
no matter how many times one does this, it's a little bit uh, daunting when you speak to your computer. Um, I'm going, just going to uh, do this. Okay, um, yeah, nice, nice to see you on the side. It is, uh, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Good morning if you are on the um, East Coast uh, from, uh, on the West Coast from us, so yes. Um, and good evening if you're on the East Coast joining. Um, my name is Muniba Isaacs, as Tuli has introduced me. I'm a professor at the University of Western Cape. Um, I, I do work on fishing communities, but I also have to be upfront. Um, I'm a little bit biased because I come from a fishing community. Uh, uh, thank you for the Department of Science and Technology uh, for the invitation. And I have to be upfront um, to all of you. I make apologies that I have another meeting that I left and I have to rejoin. So technology is making us even superhuman nowadays, joining more than one meeting at the time. So situating my talk, um, um, uh, I'm going to, it, it, it is basically, part of, you know, the All Atlantic Forum, um, Ocean Forum, and um, it is intended to drive social science towards addressing the social needs. It is part of this uh, ocean decade that, that we need to prepare ourselves. And um, just to bear in mind that 2022 is the year of the artisanal fishes, and that's a key part of my research. Uh, part of the signing of this particular agreement is to look into climate change, climate and ecosystem approaches, and also earth and ocean observation and forecasting, food security, fisheries management and aquaculture, and ocean technology. So I just want to say that my talk is going to be situated into more addressing um, science for social needs and also the issue of food security, fisheries management and um, aquaculture is where I'm going to situate my talk. So, um, no, not that one, this one. So social science during a pandemic, I think that it is important that, you know, research, my research has always looked at uh, the fisheries in terms of the social dimension. It is also uh, 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 unpack the economy and more in recent years, the blue economy. It looked at fisheries management tools um, and um, also unpacking conservation. I have been uh, uh, working on um, unpacking the concept of blue justice. Blue justice is also a concept within the blue economy that I will try to speak a bit about. And also in terms of policy, my work has been on policy. So when we're talking about fish from my perspective, it is about people, it is about the human aspects, it is about protein, it is about local uh, um, communities and obviously the species that gives them a food, that gives them livelihoods. A, a, a key part of my work is also around the um, voluntary guidelines for small scale fisheries, right to food and also tenure guidelines. And gender forms a key part of, of, of my research. One species that is incredibly important, not only for the ecosystem, but also in terms of food is the sardine fishery. And I have a paper that I've written about the humble sardine, the importance of this fishery, not only in terms of nutrition and food security, but also in terms of the ecosystem, as Daniel Poli uh, reminded us uh, uh, so well. I think that when we're looking at social science research, we often look at uh, the key part for me is methodology. Um, didn't touch you. And it is important that um, we look at what are the different methodologies that we use in fisheries and it, it, ethnographic work, which means that we spend time in communities and we get deep understanding of what are the issues within the community and no community is no matter how it looks like it is um, uh, they are homogeneous there's no community on this planet that is homogeneous in nature they are often complexities 
um, fisheries monitoring, fishery participant observation is a key, and focus group interviews. We know of biological sampling, census interviews, and, and these are the uh, mapping and GIS is a key part, modeling, econometry, and, and also social media um, analysis has become more and more part of the work. Um, in terms of methodology, it is so important in a forum like this that we uh, promote of a uh, promotion of information uh, sharing, communication, networking, and using innovative forms and format. And this year has definitely showed us how we need to be more innovative in in terms of doing our work. Um, establish common databases, interactive um, information and system, but also a common language that is important. It is far too often that social science is seen as an afterthought and seen as, okay, we now need to sort out the society problems, so let's get the social scientists involved. And this is the story of my life in South Africa, interacting with marine scientists. Um, in it's often an afterthought. And I think that that paradigm needs to shift and it needs to change. And we need to develop integrated analytic research and methodology, methodological framework to be able to deal with the grand challenges that we are framing in a transdisciplinary way and not in a disciplinary format. We will never deal with grand challenges in only one discipline, and that is that is that is clear. We have to take a regional approach, and I think that this is a all this is a um, all Atlantic forum. But regional approaches is important, and funding for regional approaches within the region is critical. And this is where the Department of science and technology play a key role. Both local, national and regional capacity is critical. Ambassadors, youth ambassadors um, is, is important. Everyone can be a scientist. It is important that we unbreak the issues of race, gender when it comes to science is, is critical. More and more, we have to start thinking of co-designing, co-authoring action research with local communities, and not only because uh, the funding is saying, uh, saying that we need to do it. Uh, it is something that we need to do as a practice is more and more important. There is an increasing role during the pandemic for resident researchers to step up and step into bigger roles when it comes to international collaboration, collaborative teams. We have seen the importance of residence researchers within the countries to be able to take on um, more and more of our leading role in research. And I hope the pandemic has taught us to be able to, to further that. Um, I just want to quickly just refer you to Ocean Stories. It's uh, of the Atlantic. It's a BBC Compass series. And this is the a journalist went to different countries, started in Newfoundland, of course. Yes, the cod, uh, the story of the cod and what happened to the cod and the sciences and, and economics that informed the cod and the communities that is left. Another story about failed management um, systems and practices is when, when she traveled to Iceland and what happened in Iceland in 2008. We all know the story of Iceland. Um, Nigeria, Lagos is, is also an important um, small scale uh, fisheries, um, important um, consumption of fish, uh, but also there's the challenges of, um, of illegal fishing of, of um, um, international vessels coming in. And then South Africa, of course, in terms of access rights, uh, it has often uh, been a challenge and the issue of IUU. I think it is important. I think the next um, issue that I want to touch on is the issue of a sustainable blue economy. We're talking about the ocean economy. We're talking about Operation Pakisa. We're talking about how to untap the oil, the gas, the phosphate, the diamonds, uh, shipping ports and industrial fishing and aquaculture. This is the model of ocean economy. Africa is spearheading its own ocean economy and linking it with sustainable uh, development. And the sustainable development goals is very critical in, in part uh, as 
as part of that. A part of that is also um, what are the marine protected areas. And just a week ago, I was in a 30 by 30, 30% 30 of the ocean space is going to be wanting to be part, uh, is, is the move to, 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 to get 30% of the ocean space in terms of, uh, uh, of, of protected areas. The issue of IUU fishing and subsidies is a critical part of the discussion in the blue economy, but there are challenges within this particular model. And particular challenges when you look at the small scale fisheries, when you look at it from the perspective of the continent, when you look at it from societal perspective, there are a lot of gaps and a lot of pe uh, people that are missing in this particular uh, sector. And the, and yeah, specifically, I'm talking about small scale fisheries. It is multi gear, multi species. Uh, uh, it has inshore coastal resources. Sixty percent of Africa's fisheries production. Um, women play a critical role, 10 million rely on small scale fisheries and 200 million as affordable source of protein on the continent and they also buy local. But there's a competition between the large scale and the small scale. And when you look at the number of employment, the consumption, the capital, the pie catch, small scale fisheries trump uh, uh, um, don't want to use that word. Small scale fisheries overtakes uh, a large scale fisheries by any chance, and especially when it comes to the environment. There are a lot of challenges. We are having, if we look at societal challenges, we need to look at the vulnerability in co coastal communities. We look at overfishing, we look at lack of participation in governance structures. What budget attention and allocation has been given to this per sector as compared to the blue economy or compared to aquaculture or compared to conservation? And I think it is important that when we deal with these grand challenges of poverty and climate change, we need to deal with the issues of, of, of these competing uh, um, factors. Um, the blue economy is a site of capital. It is the, the state, the financial institutions, the corporation and NGO activist group all continue to come together in looking at what is the blue economy. Uh, and, um, uh, and it is um, political. It is also shaped, constrained and enabled by political forces. It goes beyond the simple agreement between a human, including material or in terms of spiritual. The sea is a crucial site of this valorization of capital to be extracted, to be transported and in terms of a um, biophysical obstacle of its reproduction. The largest group of the ocean users, which is small scale uh, fishers, are excluded from the blue economy. An initiative should serve to be as a warning that the blue economy language around inclusion and participation, it is important in terms of meaningful um, engagement. Let's not leave people behind is important. I've been framing the concept of blue justice and, and here we're talking about sustainable development goals, which is separated into the social goals. We've got the infrastructure goals and we've got the environmental goals. And I promise you by 2030, we will not have achieved the social goals because we are only picking to choose that we are looking only at life below water and not those life above the water, not those who are living next to the water, and not who we are excluding when we are uh, creating marine protected areas. We have important voluntary guidelines tools that we have, but more and more there is ocean coastal land grabbing that is happening, and the human rights of people are being violated. And it is more and more important that we start talking about the mismatch of many fisheries management tools, whether it's MPAs, whether it's IUU, whether it's rights allocation fisheries, it, it, it doesn't speak to the needs of small scale fisheries. Which brings me to conservation. And um, I've been working with my colleague Bram Busher on convivial conservation, who's mainly done a lot of work on land-based uh, conservation. Um, and they have two foundational principles, which I want to bring the concept of blue justice into this convivial conservation. 
the first foundational principle is that let nature flourish more freely and let people be part of this. Let it, this means that the core approach to allow nature to flow deeper into cities, villages, and human, human settlements. And what have we seen during the pandemic? The penguins are going on a walk. We see more animals into our cities once we were in a, a lockdown. And um, the second uh, 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 principle is to transform the economy. And right now it's highly unequal. That leads to intolerable pressure on the planet. Convivial conservation is part of a broader movement and aim to restructure economy that balance and align human needs with the rest of life. This means rethinking and disaggregating the idea of the econ economic growth and distributing wealth um, uh, more equally. And which brings me to the a couple of quick questions to complete, uh, to conclude. Um, the All Atlantic um, uh, uh, Ocean Research Forum should also consider that it is now this year, 401 years since the commemoration of the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade from West Africa to the East. Is it also that we also need to start talking about decolonizing the research? and how research has been, been happening and who dictates research. We also need to be mindful of that, this new frontier of the blue economy for oil and gas and all of that is just more exploitation that we're going to have. Displacement and removal of community in the name of conservation. It is important that we bring the political economy into the debates of ecology. I find so often marine scientists would say, I'm not political. And that to me is a political statement in itself. African yeah. food system should be part of this, that the production of the food or those who harvest the food must are not eating the food is important. I think it is important that this forum need to look at how can we be disruptive? in this in terms of this uh of of, of these uh meta narratives how can we I'm, okay. I'm almost i'm almost done i'm on my last slide okay um and i think it is important that we uh, to renew how we address the societal challenges do we really need to be more efficient with fishing and scoop up uh all of these mass uh, um, species and destro destroy the environment? Do we need all the big hotels? I think it's time that we need to rethink our economics and our financial flows to end off with the South African poiki that we need to kind of put all of our ingredients in the pot to make a perfect poiki. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank very, you much. very much. Yeah. I'm going to have to, to cut you. Uh, right um, then, thank you very much, Prof, for your for your contributions. I think your passion comes across in in your delivery um, and your passion for justice and uh, multidisciplinarity in the work that we do. I, I have to move on swiftly to a very young chap that's going to come, and I'm not even going to introduce him because I think he's going to. I'm going to allow him to introduce himself. He's a grade eleven year learner that's doing phenomenal things doing phenomenal projects. And I think we want to give him an equal opportunity to share with us. Um, over to you, uh, Joseph Duda. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Joseph Duda. I'm a grade 11 learner in the school called Sofnilla High School is situated in Cape Town, South Africa. So my scientific journey began when I attended uh, a Scion science camp, which was organized by the Eka Kassini North team. There I was exposed to a fascinating thing, activities where we had to analyze and actually get taught about uh, oceanography. So at some point, uh, uh, I got to learn about microplankton. I was introduced to the world of microplankton and that really caught my attention. I was intrigued um, in wanting to learn more about these microorganisms. So that's how I came up with my investi 
in, in, in investigation. So um, my investigation, investigative question was, uh, how is macroplankton spread out from inshore to offshore areas of St. Helena Bay, which is South Atlantic Ocean? So uh, I hypothesized that uh, my, my macroplankton will increase as you move from inshore to offshore areas. So the aim of this investigation was to determine the changes of this macroplankton from inshore to offshore areas of the St. Helena Bay monitoring line. So the method, uh, for the method of collecting the data and the water from the ocean, uh, my mentor, Ms. Sashni and her colleagues, they deployed a CTD, which has uh, skin bottles. Yeah, so they, so they collected water and then as they collect water, you preserve it for some time and then you insert into a flow cam. So a flow cam will give you images as you can see on the slide, an example of an output file from an flow cam. So what I mainly did was to identify all these, all these micro, microorganisms that they find at different stations. So I could sum up the numbers and actually analyze um, the, the differences from each station. So that led to me having these results. So this is the part of showing the number of organisms that we found at these different stations. So on the y-axis, we've got the number of organisms, which is uh, the dependent variable. And then on the uh, x-axis is the, the station numbers. So this is my independent variable. So as you can see from, from inshore towards further out to the sea, the number decreases. So on station number one, we've got a, a number that is greater than 600, which is approaching 700. This, these microorganisms were more abundant, followed by the station number six, followed by station number 12 and so forth. Um, as you can see on these, on, on after the station number six uh, up to station number eight, there were no microorganisms that were, that were, that, that were collected. So this uh, led to me uh, to my discussion. As you can see, on the graphs that I showed you that ceratium are more dominant at small stations and diatoms were not abundant in any of these stations. And then the NAPL had the highest number uh, in abundance at station number six. So my conclusion, I concluded that microplankton decreases as you move from inshore to offshore areas. And so therefore my hypothesis was not accepted. Uh, I'll, I'll, my acknowledgement, I would like to thank the support that I got from the Sion Ekagasini team uh, for the mentoring and the guidance they gave me and the support from the DEWF with the support of the methods and the collection of the data from the ocean. Thank you.